timetable, so I'm going to keep the introductions very short. Uh, again, thank you all so much for coming. We're very excited to put on this event. Today we have with us uh, Professor Josh Blackman from South Texas College of Law. Professor Blackman just got tenure, I believe. Ah, last spring, yeah. Congratulations. Four fools. I can't find you. That'd be really offensive. Well deserved, I'm sure. Thank you. Uh, he teaches on a variety of subjects, and notably last year, he visited New York to speak at CUNY, where he was going to give a talk about free speech, but unfortunately some protesters disrupted the talk. You might have seen this on the news. Anyway, we thought it'd be fun to bring Josh back to New York and see if we could put on a another show or give him another shot at it. Um, also with us today we have Professor Waldron of NYU. Uh, Professor Waldron has a book, The Harm in Hate Speech, which is right here, also available on Amazon. But not in Kindle format. Is it not? No, you got to look into that. Yeah. <laughs> I'd recommend it. It's a pretty good book. Um, so the topic today, should hate speech be regulated? Um, I'll give it over to Professor Blackman. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's great to be here in this room. It's very tight and cozy, but we'll be friends here. Our topic today is regulating hate speech. And I think Professor Walter wrote a definitive book called The Harm in Hate Speech. Um, I want to focus on one specific application of hate speech, which is in college campuses, which is what I know most about. Um, there's a lot that I think we do agree on. Um, there are many speakers who go to campuses for the sole purpose of inciting provocation, for getting a reaction, for, quote, owning the libs, as they say nowadays, right? Um, you think of Milo, or maybe an Ann Coulter, maybe Ben Shapiro lower on that list. But you can think of people who go there to try and incite, basically pissing people off, and they want to see that's a reaction. And there are other people in the spectrum who aren't like that. And I would probably put myself in this category and most federal society speakers. We go here to convey ideas that you may not agree with, you may not like, but they're ideas I think are worth hearing. The difficulty with hate speech and always is where do you fall along the spectrum? And Professor Waldron has a very nice diagram in his book. You put this little X in the middle of it. You're trying to provoke. You're trying to have exchange of ideas. Um, but I think the hate speech bleeds into another area that Professor's written about, which is how students can respond to hate speech. And that comes in the context of heckling, which is something I know more about than I did last year. Right? So a few basic things we agree on as well. Um, I don't think you have a right to come to a campus to speak, right? I'm here because Ian and students want to hear me speak. They want to hear Professor Waldron speak, so we're here to exchange ideas. Um, I also don't think you have the right to like what I have to say, right? I may say things that piss you off, and that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, but what happens if you're convinced that my speech is not worth being heard? What do you think that my speech is, in fact, hate speech? And your university will not cancel my invitation. So in other words, I am coming to your campus, you can't keep me out of the building, and I'm going to be here saying words that you deem hateful. At that point, what do you do as a student? I think Professor Waldron has a very good article on, on heckling. He says, well, there's actually positive value in heckling, right? There's no right for me to speak here unmolested, right? I come here, you're all sitting here nice and quiet, attentive. It does not be that way. It can be like parliament back in the UK, right, where people are yelling and screaming at each other. But where, does that, where do we part company? I think we part company in whether students recognize when that's appropriate, when administrators recognize when a cancellation is appropriate. And the difficulty is always in the details, right? Uh, who gets to decide who to invite? Uh, once an invitation is made, what is a disruption? And if there's a disruption, what sort of discipline can the university impose on the students? And a lot of this comes back to a central point, which I think we'll disagree on very strongly, is how do you define the type of speech that denies a person the dignity, to use his language, that justifies disruption, that perhaps justifies heckling, that justifies a disinvitation, that justifies deplatforming someone, as they say nowadays. Okay? So that's the first big question, right? How do we define the sort of speech, hate speech, whatever label you want to use, that deprives a person of the relevant dignity of a personhood that justifies imposing any sort of civil disobedience on them. The second question I think we can discuss today is how do you actually draft that in language? And I'm not interested in governments. Governments can do things. I'm talking about universities, right? If we're a university administrator and we want to draft a conduct policy for students, right, that says if you do X, you will be disciplined. 
or you draft a, a policy that says, um, you know, if a speaker has certain conditions or certain statements, he is not welcome on our campus, right? How do you actually draft that in practice? The most important question is, if a student engages in activities, what discipline should be imposed upon them? That seems a very difficult question. And the third and last question I want to pose to the professor is, what do we do about the Supreme Court and the Constitution? Because I think we both agree that in the current doctrine, at least at a public university, a lot of the sort of speech codes that he would advance probably would not pass constitutional muster. And I think he admits that candidly. So the question is, how would we actually amend our basic laws, our First Amendment in case law, to actually permit the sort of speech regulations that exist in other nations, Germany and UK, pick your country, okay? So those are the big things I want to discuss. So I want to fast forward. I, I don't want to show you the entire protest because it's about an hour and a half long. But I want to tell you just generally what happened to me last year. I'll give you a very, I don't have nearly enough time for that, but I'll give you a very, a very, a very brief clip. So I speak at a lot of law schools, about maybe 40 or 50 a year. I travel around the country. Um, I speak on a lot of topics. Um, I am a conservative libertarian, however you want to define that, right? I generally take a fairly originalist view of the Constitution. Um, I think some things are unconstitutional that, we may, that you may like. So for example, I've written at length that DACA, the policy for dreamers, I think it's a very good policy, but I think it's illegal. I don't think Congress can do it by itself. Um, I think the travel ban, President Trump's travel ban, was a terrible policy, but I think he has the power to do it. And I've made these statements fairly openly and candidly. Okay, that's the backdrop. Last year, I was invited to speak at CUNY Law School, right over in Queens, not too far from here, and my topic was free speech. Okay, I've done that before, just like here today. Um, the students were not able to find any member of the faculty to actually sit next to me, which is why Professor Waldron is an A+. He actually decided to spend his busy day to come talk with me. But about three days before the event at CUNY took place, I get an email from the students saying that, uh, we pass up pamphlets about your attendance, that you're coming, and they're forming a protest. A protest? I thought, I've never protested. Why are you protested? They said, well, they think that you're, you're a white nationalist and that you're going to bring hate speech to our campus. I'm like, what? I had never heard of such things. But I said, all right, whatever. I didn't believe them. So then I come on campus, and uh, I'm sitting in a classroom waiting to get started. And the CUNY security person came over and said, uh, Josh, there's a big protest about 40, 50 people outside the classroom. I said, all right, whatever. And he said, Josh, what's your exit strategy? <laughs> My what? How do you plan to leave the building? I'm like, Uber? He's like, okay, good. You're not taking the subway. I'm like, oh. Like, it didn't quite click, right? That when you have 50 people who think you're poses a risk to your physical violence. So I ask you, right? Was that a heckler's veto, right? If you have 50 people outside and there's a risk of violence, would you enter that classroom? My dad's here, he told me, no way. He told me, no way, don't go back. So I don't listen to him, right? <laughs> but would you, I love you, dad. But would you enter a classroom if they said there's a possible risk of physical violence? Or would you say, screw this, I'm leaving? Okay. Let me actually play a little bit of video. I'm not playing the entire thing. Is there no audio? We can take the lights down a little bit if we like. No, there's no audio. Uh, volume. Oh, no. Uh, oh, boy. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not the audio. It was working before. Uh, oh, there it is. Yeah, that's what it is. There it is. Thank you. Okay, so let me just 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 run that back to you can see that. Okay, I'll play more in a minute. So it's hard to read the science moving quickly, but they called me every ist in the book, a racist, a sexist, a misogynist, a homophobe, a transphobe, an ableist. I mean, everything, a Nazi, a fascist, right? I mean, just go down the list, right? And they did this not based on something I've actually said, but based on the understanding of who I probably am, right? That I generally am a federal society member and the federal society exists from white supremacy and things of this nature, okay? Now, they thought I was engaging in hate speech. And I think under Professor Waldron's rubric that if they believe this firmly, that my speech is hateful, then their conduct is actually justified. And here I agree. The protest outside the room is fine. I actually didn't object to it. I walked right past it. 
Didn't really phase me, um, but whatever. But then you walk into the room. And the room's empty, right? There were, you know, 50 odd people. I didn't even count. About 50 people outside, and there were like three or four guys in the room. Now, there's actually a relevant point here, okay? Several of the students told me that they were afraid to be seen with me, so they didn't go into the classroom right away. Because they didn't want to be seen with a hateful bigot, which, which is me, right? Um, but I want to fast forward, and then, you know, I need to play the entire thing. So eventually, they come up right behind me. They basically circle the room, and they're standing right behind me. So the same distance as this guy standing right here, that's how close they were to me. And, you know, it's a little intimidating, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big guy, right? Uh, and they're standing right around the room holding up signs, right? Every time I open my mouth, they start screaming and shouting. Okay? I'll just play one clip. Okay? That, I... Here, I'm going to play. So... I had a choice at that point, right? I could have stormed out. I didn't do that. I could have called them a bunch of little snowflakes. I'm not going to do that either, right? So I said, let me try something else. Let me actually try to engage these little kids. And I'll call them kids because I think they're acting mature. But let me try to engage them. So I started to ask them questions, right? They put out this little pamphlet, a little sh flyer, which you can see I'm holding in my hand, where they wrote like 15 things about me that were kind of true, but like related to the truth. They were like based on something I wrote, but out of context. And I started reading them, saying, let's talk about each item on your list. I surrender the talk I want to give, right? I didn't give what I wanted to give. Professor Waldron writes by says, well, you have no right to give the talk you want. If, you know, you come to participate talking about A and they give you a question, you go talk about B instead. I was like, okay, I'm going to actually, on the fly, okay? So, congratulations, you made me very feel not welcome, but I'm still going to say what I'd like to say. Thank you, thank you, I tried. So, I actually want to start. I actually want to start. Uh, th this was about six minutes in. I hadn't actually said a word. Um, if you ever try talking over people, shouting, it's very difficult, right? It, it throws you off your game, which is not necessarily a bad thing. You have your composure, right? You're ready for it. But the question I think of is, how would you have reacted if you were in this spot and you were trying to give a lecture on whatever topic you find interesting and you're getting disrupted in this fashion, okay? So just... The one legal argument you actually made, you said... <laughs> The violence is just the law, and it's a myth that law is inherently neutral. Okay? You said there's a myth of legal objectivity. So let me talk about legal, legal objectivity for a few minutes, right? Someone did some excellent opposition research. Let me do this, I actually applaud you. You found about seven or eight bullets on various videos I've given over the years. But I want to make a few points. For example, you wrote that I supported the yeah, president's the decision to increase the docket. Now, let me talk is that the policy itself was not consistent with the rule of law, which teaches a lesson, right? The lesson is this. You can support something as a matter of policy, but then find that the law doesn't permit it. And then the answer is to change the law. Fuck the law. Why don't you support the law? Right? OK, so you hear that, right? So one of the aspects of the sort of heckler's veto and, and hate speech works into it is at a certain point, eventually, you get down to actually discussing arguments. And, and this group was utterly incapable. I tried engaging them, and their response was, fuck the law. Okay. I'm not going to play the rest of it. I'll just fast forward very quickly. About three or four minutes in, they all left, right? They left the room. And then towards the end, it actually filled up with students, right? The room was full, and people came in. And I answered questions for an hour and a half. Thank you. I answered questions for nearly nine, for almost an hour and 20 minutes on every range of topics, on originalism, on slavery, on criminal justice, whatever questions they wanted, right? So why am I using this illustration, right? When you have a definition of hate speech that's as broad and capacious as it is in certain contexts, anyone can be deemed a hater, hater, a hater, right? And if you base yourself only on a superficial knowledge of a person, you can then deplatform them and get them out of your campus. But if you actually listen to them for any period of time, it will become clear that you are mistaken. The protesters didn't even give me that chance. The second I started talking to them, they left the room. They stormed out. They weren't interested in hearing me talk. So let me summarize and bring it back to our topic of, of the day. Um, I agree with Professor Waldron on a lot of points. I think there, is a lot, there are a lot of speakers who try to go to campus to get a reaction out of people and who aren't there to engage in ideas. And there are other speakers who do not fit that mold. When you have these open-ended definitions of hate speech and white nationalism and everything else, everyone's either black or white. You're either in the club or you're not. You're either woke or you're not. 
And I think that's a, a lack of judgment, a lack of clarity for far too many students. So I'll repeat the three questions I posed to start of class, right? Right? How do we define hate speech? And that could be in a statute in Congress, it could be in a state statute, it could be in a university disciplinary code, right? Right? How do we deal with the First Amendment, right? Assuming we have a state university, which this is not one of them, but we do have state universities, how, what's the obligation of state universities to deal with speakers of different perspectives that students may feel affected by? And the third question is, what discipline is warranted for those who disrupt events? Or maybe this disruption was fine, right? Maybe you say, well, Josh, you got to speak for an hour and a half. They just came in and made their piece for five minutes. What's the big deal? I say this in actual sincerity. I don't know what I think about this case, right? I am so conflicted. I've been thinking about this for a year. Um, it turns out none of these students were disciplined. There was zero discipline imposed. And I'm on the fence whether they should or should not. Um, I wasn't crazy about them standing six inches over my shoulder. It could have gotten violent quickly. It didn't. I'm grateful, but it could have gotten violent. But I myself am conflicted because I don't exactly know how a university should deal with this sort of situation because you don't want a policy where you're punishing students for exercising their perspectives, right? I don't come here with just a monopoly to say whatever I want. You guys can engage me and engage Professor Waldron, but I don't know where that line is, and I hope our discussion today might shed some light on it. So I will stop here. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, sir. And to Professor Waldron. Thank you so much. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, sir. So um, the way we're organizing this is um, I'm going to speak for 15 minutes, as Josh just did, and talk a little bit how to answer his questions, particularly the first two questions. And then each of us has a right of reply to what the other says. Probably Josh will go first on that as well. Please. That's, that's fine. And particularly in the right of reply, I want to talk about the, the video and the, and the college stuff. But I really do want to address especially his first two questions. How do we define hate speech? How do we do this difficult job of drafting uh, the regulations that people like me think are sometimes called for? And that's partly a matter of what it is that we think calls for them. What's the problem here to which the drafting would be a response? So I'm going to talk a little bit about that. And I also do want to talk about how do we deal with constitutional protections for free speech if we are determined to draft, draft these regulations. Now, on the drafting thing, especially if we move away from the, the college campuses, which are a dog's breakfast of different and broad and capacious and objectionable um, uh, formulations, if we go to what the legislatures of the world have done on this, and that's the, the legislatures of all our major allies, well, do we have any allies? But we, uh, the legislature of Israel, for example, which is a major ally, um, all the European countries, Canada, uh, Australia, New Zealand, um, most advanced democracies, um, they have hate speech laws which purport to condemn and punish hate speech responding particularly to people's race or ethnicity and in recent years responding to their religion. And there's a few features that we've learned now about how these, these, um, these pieces of legislation are set up. Josh talked a little bit about hateful speech and it's a, it's, a, it's a striking phrase. But speech can be hateful at the input end and at the output end. So sometimes we think of hate speech as speech that expresses hatred, rather in the way that, I don't know, a shouted epithet might express hatred. When, as one judge once said, when uh, tempers are high and flagons are low, um, people will shout out things and you can almost, as it were, taste or hear the hatred in the phrase. So that's hate speech as expressive of hatred hatred. But most laws drafting this matter are interested, not interested in that at all. They're interested in hate speech as evocative of hatred, hate speech that aims to stir up hatred, hate, hate speech that aims to have a certain effect on the environment. So the laws in Britain, uh, in most parts of, of uh, Europe, um, some of the laws in Canada have that characteristic. They say whoever uh, gives some speech or publishes some item which is intended to or which reasonably could be expected to have the effect of stirring up hatred in the community against the members of a particularly designated group commits a, a criminal offence and then there's a number of uh, possible defences that they may have. But the, 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 the offence is the offence of trying to stir up hatred 
in, in against the group. It's not exactly a literally content-based um, problem, although in my book I maybe rashly conceded that it was, because it's not that the content is hateful, it's that the speech, whatever it is, is intended to stir up hatred uh, in, the, in, in the community. And so the evil that the law is aimed at is not the expression of hatred, it's not the, the particular content of the speech, it's the flourishing or the production of a certain sort of social atmosphere. I said to you a moment ago, you know, that people care about hate speech because they care about certain evils that it may give rise to. And the one evil that characterizes most of the democracies that have legislated against this is that they are worried about stirring up intercommunal antagonism, intercommunal hatred, or worse still, intercommunal violence. We know that in some countries, Ireland was one, Northern Ireland was one, Nigeria is another, um, countries where different defined sub-communities are at each other's throats. And it's one of the most horrendous things that can happen to a political community is to have subsections of the community stirred up in hatred against one another. Israel has to worry about this, obviously, and that motivated their hate speech laws and their religious worship protection laws and so on. But the idea, for example, in Britain in the 1960s when the Race Relations Act was enacted, they knew there was going to be an influx of migrants from the Caribbean and from East Africa, and they knew that there was going to be a problem because maybe the British people are inherently racist, or a great deal of them are, and that it was the government's responsibility to do what it could to see that the atmosphere into which these people would be uh, arriving was not poisoned by the toxin of people attempting to stir up hatred. So it was seen as an almost public health problem, as an environmental problem. And everyone said, and it's a reasonable thing to say as a first, as a first cut, you've got to wait until there's actually some fighting words. You've got to wait until there's some real threat, until there's some actual intimidation. And those who took this social peace, environmental approach said, that's like telling me that Waldron doesn't need to fit an emissions device to his automobile unless his automobile right there, that automobile is in danger of poisoning somebody. But we know that's not how environmental harms happen. They happen cumulatively. And nothing but millions of drivers fitting emissions uh, devices to their automobiles is going to abate that possibility. So the suggestion was we needed to pull back a little bit from imminence because by the time the violence between communities becomes imminent, it may be too late. So it was some sense of responsibility with regard to social peace. I didn't stress that line of argument so much in the book that, that Josh um, generously referred to. But I think there's a second line of argument, which is quite apart from the social prospect of conflict and the real danger of endangering the social peace. It's also a matter of having an environment in which people can live decent lives, bring up their children without fear, not feeling excluded. Not necessarily that they must be congratulated and, uh, and welcomed with great banners and open arms, but that the atmosphere in a society should be such that people can go about their business and lead ordinary lives without fear, but also without being defamed by virtue of some group attribute that they have and by um, not being shunned and so on. So the idea was, again, the hate speech is often intended to create an atmosphere in which that becomes very difficult for the members of a minority to live their lives and go about their business and create an atmosphere in which people are defamed. And the use of the term defamation, it's used particularly in German hate speech law and some Danish hate speech law. The, the concern is about basic defamation, uh, not individual defamation, as when somebody says Waldron's a bad professor and never does his work and never returns his grades on time. That would be defamatory mm -hmm. at a particular level. But we're talking about very basic defamation, denigrating a, a person's ability to... to um, a person's ability to actually be a reliable fellow citizen in the most ordinary attributes of life. And when hate speech laws were upheld by the Supreme Court of the United States in around the 1950s, in the great case of Bohane against Illinois, that's Bo as in French for beautiful, Bohane, um, the suggestion was that maybe that's how we reconciled it with with First Amendment concerns. First Amendment doesn't absolutely privilege speech, although it's near absolute in a number of areas. But one area where, where, where it, the First Amendment gives way is um, in the area of defamation, constrained, of course, by New York Times against Sullivan, 
but here we're not talking about the defamation of public figures. We're talking about the defamation of the ordinary members of the group who are just trying to bring up their children and, and go shopping and conduct their businesses and live their lives. It's no accident that an organization that aims to protect the rights of Jewish people in the United States is called the Anti-Defamation League. This was, this was once a, a, a very considerable concern. And around the time of Bohane, our friends uptown at Columbia set up clinics trying to draft um, criminal defamation statutes or group defamation statutes. That was their approach to the drafting problem that I'm talking about. So there's a, there are those two parallel concerns about the fostering of an atmosphere of hate and about the possible effect, intended effect, or reasonably expected effect of um, hate speech. And it's in response to that that we do the drafting. It's in response to that that we look at the ways in which professional legislative drafts persons in these other democracies have gone about their, their business. They've been very careful saying it's the effect that's interesting, not the content of the speech. They've been very careful about laying down defenses. It doesn't matter if you say it in private. They've been very careful about um, uh, indicating safe havens where people can voice their opinions. And they've above all been very careful, and this is where Josh and I are in agreement, about not leaving this at the mercy of whatever renter mob wants to disrupt a particular. The administration of many of these hate laws of these hate speech laws is left in the hands of the National Attorney General, which in, say, Great Britain is a non-political office, and you can't get a prosecution going without the Attorney General's consent, so that there's this kind of a filter for prosecutions of this sort. Yes, thank you. Um, so we have experience of drafting, and sometimes it's worth looking at the, at the, uh, the drafting of particular legislation just to see how it could be done, because we have a tendency to think, well, how on earth would you even begin the task of drafting? Well, guess what? The rest of the nations of the world, they haven't solved the problem, but they have made some attempts. In the 2000s, after 9-11 and after 7-7 in Great Britain, religious hate speech offences were added to the stable of, um, to the stable of uh, racist hate speech. And one of the things that was done there in the drafting was to clearly distinguish stirring up hatred against the members of a religious group by saying, for example, all Muslims are potential terrorists. For example, so it's a community that's just seen trains ripped apart or buildings ripped apart is, is a terrible thing to say about the members of the community. To distinguish between that and defaming the religion itself. And the suggestion is that we need to draft a hate speech statute so that it condemns the defaming of the individuals, but permits the defaming of the religion. So um, can I read you section 29J of the Public Order Act in the UK? Nothing in this part of the Act shall be read or given effect in a way which prohibits or restricts discussion, criticism, or expressions of antipathy, expressions of dislike, ridicule, insult or abuse of particular religions or the beliefs and practices of their adherents or of any other belief system, or proselytizing or urging adherents of a different religion or belief system to cease practicing their religion or belief. So there's an attempt to drive a wedge between, between offensive, religiously offensive speech and speech that attempts to denigrate or stir up hatred against people. Now, it's not always easy, not always easy to draw that line, but that's a heroic attempt to legislate such a line. Thank you very much indeed, Ian. Um, now, in the countries that I've talked about, whose legislation I've been describing, those are all countries whose constitutional law, or whose basic law in the case of Germany, or whose human rights law in the case of most of the European countries, or whose New Zealand Bill of Rights law, I'm a New Zealander in New Zealand, all contain fairly strong regulations upholding freedom of speech. And so the problem of reconciling uh, hate speech regulation with free speech is a problem that every advanced democracy also has to deal with. Not only that, but in every advanced democracy there are many, many articulate opponents of hate speech regulation. Not necessarily as articulate as Josh, but... but, but, but he charms, he charms. <laughs> best way of disarming. But, but it's... it's um, I had the best debates on hate speech 
that I've ever had when I was in England. I was teaching at Oxford for a while uh, in recent years and with people like Timothy Garton Ash and his free speech project. And partly the advantage of those debates is that those people know the laws that they're dealing with. So they're acquainted with it and they can talk about it. But every society, every society, not just this one, has people who oppose hate speech regulation. Every society has to face up to the question, which we have to face up to, how to reconcile hate speech legislation with with uh, a, a strong commitment to free speech. Every society has to deal with the question of whether the free speech value is unlimited and absolute or whether it's limited in, in, in certain respects. So um, kind of what I want to do in the, my closing few seconds is just to uh, insist that we, as it were, diffuse the antagonism a little bit, certainly from the level seen over here, but also as between um, me and Josh, who hold these different views, um, I don't think it's ever a cut and dried issue. My own view is that whether to have hate speech legislation is a legislative problem and should be left in the hands of responsible legislators. Uh, you may look around the buffoons and idiots who inhabit the swamp in Washington and say, we have no responsible <laughs> legislators. And maybe, and maybe you're right. Um, but it would be an ideal of a, of a decent society that legislators would shoulder the responsibility of trying to think about whether these laws are necessary, what the dangers of them would be, uh, how they're likely to be mirrored in workplace codes and campus codes of the sort that Josh was alluding to, and how we would solve that separate layer of the problem that I hope we'll talk about when we get back to our, mm -hmm. our rebuttals. But mostly what I wanted to do was to indicate that attempts have been made to grapple with these issues. You can't grapple with them unless you are aware of why we have why there is a some sort of pressure or impulse to have hate speech laws, unless we acknowledge what that pressure and impulse means. Josh, in a number of places, said that he supported certain policies, but he had to concede that sometimes those policies were constitutionally prohibited. And that may well be what, what we end up saying, because Bohane may no longer be good law, never been overturned, but it may no, no longer be upheld. The, the courts may no longer have any inclination to uphold it. And so we have to work our hate speech prohibitions through these more informal mechanisms. Because that's the last thing I want to say is in the absence of properly drafted hate speech regulations, what you get is not a paradise of free speech. What you get is this sort of nonsense um, when people, as it were, take the law into their own hands. Sometimes that's kind of justified because we need lively debate, not the kind of dead debate where the audience has been disciplined and cowed by threats from the administration. You must sit still and listen to this. Forgive me. Listen to this bullshit. You know, and, and, uh, accurate. <laughs> not accurate. But for some of the people that, that Josh mentioned, it is bullshit. And the notion that uh, people are entitled to get invited onto campus and assured of a captive, quiet, deferential audience may be a little bit of exaggeration. Anyway, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I have, um, I have five minutes for rebuttal. And uh, let me give you a lesson that might be very germane to you. Um, you're all law students, I think. Uh, hopefully in a couple years be lawyers, maybe not. I don't know, maybe you're going abroad, but you'll be lawyers. And when you're a lawyer, you have to follow certain rules of ethics. And there are lots of rules of legal ethics, friends. Conflicts of interest, and you have to handle client money properly. You have to respect the court, right? But about a year ago, the American Bar Association passed what's called Model Rule 8.4G, and it prohibits, I'm just going to read you a very brief definition, speech that might be demeaning or derogatory towards someone else on the basis of uh, race, sex, religion, national origin, ethnicity, disability, age, sexual orientation, gender identity, the entire <laughs> roster, right? So if you're engaged in conduct related to the practice of law, and you engage in speech that might be deemed demeaning or derogatory, that's the language used in the rule, you can be subject to discipline. That's in the ballpark of the statutes that Professor Walter mentioned earlier. Not exactly, but it's in the ballpark. Um, so I've actually given a lot of lectures on this rule, and I think this is troubling that lawyers cannot be disciplined for their private speech for engaging. So I want to give you examples of 11 different statements that I think are worth protecting that could run into a foul on this rule. Okay. So first, let's talk about race. I'm up here. I'm giving a lecture to law students. This might be for continuing education credits. This is related to the practice of law. Just assume that for now. What if I want to discuss mismatch theory? You know what that is? It's the argument that affirmative action 
actually hurts minority students because it places them in an educational environment where they have a lower chance of success. Now, I don't have the intent to incite hatred. That's not my intent. It's not my heart. But I could suspect if I get that lecture in this room, people might get upset by it. They might feel demeaned the base of race. And let me make this very clear. When the Supreme Court had arguments in the affirmative action case, Fisher, Justice Scalia was talking about mismatch a couple years ago, and people went livid. They called him a racist and everything else, right? So <coughs> here's an area where there's, I think there's a fairly robust scholarship dispute where if I gave this lecture, I might be liable for inciting some sort of hatred, right? What if I said that women should not be eligible for combat duty in the military because they're not strong enough, and I want my soldiers to be strong and safe? Now, I don't intend to incite hatred. I'm giving a perspective, which I don't hold. But someone might think that I'm being demeaning to women. What if I said that uh, the federal government should have the power to exclude aliens from certain countries because people in those countries are dangerous? That's on the basis of nationality. That, that, that could be pretty demeaning, right? And the Supreme Court just upheld a policy very similar to what I just described. What if I come in here and say teaching con law? Korematsu is correct. Right? It was correctly decided that Japanese people pose a threat to the United States and President Roosevelt was right to do what he did. Again, I don't hold that view, but I can imagine some Asian Americans would be pretty upset by that sort of statement. Uh, what if I said that people with mental handicaps should be eligible for the death penalty? Again, it's an issue the court litigates, but people with disabilities may be very you know, offended by that and they may not like it, may demean their dignity as a person. Uh, same-sex marriage. A burger fell was wrong. Supreme Court just made that up, right? Uh, Supreme Court says nothing about LGBT discrimination. Uh, gender identity. People should go to the bathroom of their biological sex, period. Did I just demean transgender people? Probably, right? I can go down this list. I got, I got, I got examples for us today. Now again, I don't hold these views, but I give these as examples of statements that can be made in what I think is reasonable discourse that could run afoul of this model ABA rule that is being pushed through. Now, only one state's adopted it. Now, why do I think that this matters? Who gets to decide? Now, Professor Waldron says that the responsibility to prosecute is placed in high-ranking officials, the uh, National Attorney General, right? Well, I have to hire a lawyer, right? I may have to get a counsel. I have to deal with this for years. Imagine now you're an attorney in the United States. The Bar Disciplinary Council is nonpartisan, right? People who discipline the Bar, nonpartisan. You got to hire a lawyer. If your boss finds out you have this charge against you, maybe you won't make partner. Maybe you'll lose your job, right? There are a lot of collateral consequences with these line drawing issues, right? In my mind, I agree with a lot of what he said about the dignitary harms of speech. But what scares me more is who gets to draw that line. What scares me more is who gets to decide who to prosecute. And that scares the wits out of me because you wonder what? They're coming for me. When these CUNY kids graduate and become district attorney, right? and they become attorney general, and they're on the bench, and they're sitting in courts, and they say that my speech is hateful, I'm silenced. So all of you are listening to me captively, enraptured, right? The bullshit I'm spewing, right? But that goes away if people like that are in charge of the powerful cudgel of policing hate speech. Thank you very much. Thanks, Josh. Um, I agree with you that a formulation like the model ABA rule that you mentioned is, is um, it's way too broad and it's way too capacious and it opens, opens the path to the kind of abuses that you talk about, particularly um, the lower down the prosecutorial level proceedings can be, can be um, uh, instituted. Now, I said I was a New Zealander, so I have to say something bad about the Australians. <laughs> <laughs> the Australians have hate speech legislation, but their offense is to find it's unlawful for a person to do an act otherwise than in private if the act is reasonably likely in all the circumstances to offend, mm. insult, humiliate, or intimidate another person or a group of people, blah, 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 and it's done on account of their race, color, national origin, or religion. And that's looking for the immediate effect on the person concerned as a demeaning uh, uh, requirement would. And again, I want to emphasize the better formulations used throughout the world, used in New Zealand and other countries, has to do with the effect. Sometimes it has to do with ad adverbs plus effect. So the New Zealand formulation says, 
Um, it shall be unlawful for any person to use in any place words which are threatening, abusive, or insulting. If the person knew or ought to have known that the words were reasonably likely to excite hostility against or bring into contempt any group of persons in New Zealand or who may be coming to New Zealand. That's all of us after another <laughs> Trump presidency. But um, uh, So they draft it carefully. They say it's got to satisfy certain adverbial tests, plus it's got to satisfy this intent or objective intent test. And, and I, so I agree with the, the concerns about rough, broad um, measures like um, demeaning and derogatory. Now, I wanted to say a little bit about heckling, because I didn't enjoy that. I mean, it was fun, but I didn't enjoy that, <laughs> that spectacle. Uh, I do think it's very important that we not understand free speech as just the freedom of each of us to give us speech, that we listen to in silence like a special order speech given in Congress in the middle of the night when nobody in the chamber is listening. I have the, the British parliamentary model in, in mind with, with a certain amount of uproar in the chamber and people get used to by their training handling, handling, handling uh, interjections and, and heckling between the two rows of uh, parliamentarians across the aisle from one another. I think that's quite good. They have a, a slightly more formalized mode too where you can interrupt, formally interrupt another person's speech and say, will the honorable member give way to a question? And then the person will say, yeah, and he'll ask a question and then resume his seat and the honorable member will answer it and then carry on. And the honorable member may, may refuse. He says, no, no, I've got a lot to get through and so on. But having anything which breaks up the tedium of a set of individual addresses listened to in silence, or anything which breaks up the connection between political choreography and free speech. Why do people get dragged out of public election meetings now for shouting uh, comments or interruptions? They don't get dragged out because they're drowning out President Trump. If I just shout out something, it's not drowning out President Trump, but I will be dragged from the meeting. I may be beaten, I may not be beaten, but I will be dragged from. I was at a graduation once at Columbia Law School, and one of my students was the daughter of Al Gore, and uh, Al Gore was vice president and presidential candidate that year. And somebody sitting in the audience, my environment! Some, some <laughs> such. <laughs> and all of us, including all our free speech colleagues, just sat there as the security went zeroing in and dragged that person <laughs> out, out, out of the occasion. We are I mean, we have concerns about security, of course. We have concerns about disorder. But mostly, it seems, we have concerns about disruption. Everything's been precisely planned and drafted and focus grouped, and, and we want the speaker to be able to proceed on exactly the basis with exactly the climaxes that will elicit applause, and, and um, uh, we want that choreography to be guaranteed. And I say it's no part of the free speech ideal in the First Amendment Constitution of the United States to guarantee political choreography. I do think it's important that we have vigorous engagement I do think it's important that it be vigorous and intelligent engagement, which this, <laughs> this wasn't necessarily, although some of the signs were extremely interesting. Um, mostly people need to acknowledge that when they go into college, uh, they're going to be dealing with a tough crowd, high-spirited, highly concerned individuals, and nobody's entitled that that crowd be sitting silent. We used to have a culture of heckling and a culture of interruption, even in our parliamentary proceedings in the United States. You see the movie Lincoln now? during the passage of the 13th Amendment, and it was complete uproar all the time in the House, back and forth. Now, occasionally that broke out in violence before the Civil War, but even quite short of anything remotely resembling violence, there was a, a tendency that speeches would not be listened to in silence, that speeches would be uh, responded to, and people were on the, had to think on their feet and be able to respond to interruptions. And I wish we could have more of that, even under the auspices of an invigorated and high-spirited free speech idea. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Uh, so we'll do just a few minutes of Q and A. It's twelve fifty, so I know some folks are going to have to talk. So. Oh wow! Okay. Uh, you want to call people, Ian? Uh, sure. Let's do that. Um, you, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting. Uh, just a question for you, Professor. Um, so I would assume that speech that we all would see as facially hateful, you would be against, you wouldn't be opposed to curtailing, right? Like, speech that we can all agree is all the way outside of the mainstream or what we would think would be vital for a healthy, vigorous debate. So I'm, it seems to me that your 
concerned is that things that you might say will be construed by people as being hate speech. Um, but I think the other concern is that, for example, you made an argument that the travel ban has a legal basis, but DACA does not. And like, there could, I definitely can see how you can make that argument on a constitutional basis. But there are people who are open racists who might take that as intellectual validation for their own beliefs, right, which are just purely racist beliefs. And going to Professor Waldron's point of evocative speech, are you not concerned that, in, especially in this moment of heightened tension, you're just giving intellectual cover for people who act in bad faith with the intention of creating dysfunction society and causing marginalized people to go under harm that they wouldn't necessarily have to undergo? Oh, what a good question. And uh, I'm going to try to answer each part of it. So the first one is that giving intellectual validation to people I disagree with. You know, I have a Google alert for my name. And one time, my, you all should, and my name popped up on the Daily Stormer website. You know what that is? It's a, it's a neo-Nazi. My grandparents were Holocaust survivors. And they're actually citing me for some, I can't remember what it was, some argument made that they were citing my name. So I, I hear you, right? Um, that's not going to stop me from speaking my mind. Uh, so I, I, I won't go through the validation point. But, but the second point, you know, or actually your first point was, is there some speech I think is so out of bounds that should be curtailed? If it's just speech, um, no. Um, I, I think a seminal free speech case we have is the Skokie March, which you probably read about in, in con law, where the neo-Nazis and skinheads want to march down in Skokie, Illinois, uh, a highly high Jewish community population, right? And the ACLU, at least at that point, supported the right to march. Uh, then we have something like in Charlottesville that happened a year or so ago, and they were marching and they're also armed, which is also problematic. And then you have the counter protest. So I think these create very difficult rules. But if you're asking me, can you deny a parade permit to a group based on their message? Um, I'm, I'm not going along with that. You might, you might say you can march in this space and have security around them to, to safeguard it. Now, a better question is, if you're a campus group, more relevant to you guys, and you want to invite a speaker, who I think we all agree is probably very awful, can the university know you can't invite him? Or can the university say, okay, you can bring this guy, but you have to spend $50,000 in the private security force, right? Which no sort of group has a budget to pay for. Does the university have an obligation to pay for security to keep their students safe? These, these are tough questions, right? And I would rather debate the funding question than the disinvitation question, right? I'd rather say, fine, invite the guy that's figuring out how to pay for it, then no, you can't invite him. Because I know I'll make a point. We all know what these speakers have to say. We can watch them on YouTube, right? You can watch, I've given this lecture 20 times, but the values, you ask me a question, one-on-one, -on -one, human to human, that's the value. And I think a little spirit of disruption is fine. No one, no one, no one interrupted us, though. I was actually saying, is someone going to attempt to say, hey, Professor Walsh, I'm going to interrupt you now. I'm going to say, with the gentleman yield, right? No one, no one's talking about <laughs> <laughs> All right. Professor Walsh, you want to add anything? Not on that, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, you, miss. Uh, thank you so much for um, the conversation here. It was really, really interesting. Um, I had a question, I thought, um, when you're talking about free, free speech on campus or perhaps protests on campus, when you're talking about how universities might think about carefully drafting policies to, um, as you mentioned, Professor Kaufman, uh, how we might discipline these students mm -hmm. or perhaps um, come up with some kind of regulation for um, speech like this that perhaps would interrupt um, guests, lectures, whatever else. Um, I wonder if you run the risk, perhaps, of, of uh, delegitimizing protest or the value of protest. Mm -hmm. um, because it is often disruptive, transgressive, um, and often legitimate <coughs> protest for civil disobedience can be this way. And I wonder how you would come up with a policy that both make, uh, both allows everyone to perhaps be heard and um, allow speakers to come without being, I guess, deplatformed, but also not just discourage students from protesting, also not just put, you know, Accept a list of acceptable protest methods together for students. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you have a yeah. On that. So, you know, there are about fifty or sixty-six people in the room right here. Um, none of you thought to interrupt me while speaking. None of you thought to interrupt him. I think a norm has developed on most campuses that when a professor or speaker is speaking, he has X minutes. We have fifteen, fifteen, five, and five, and then reserve Q and A. I'm okay with that as a rule. That the rule is you don't prevent the person from speaking so long as there's a Q and A at the end. I'm okay with that. Now your point is fair. 
that excludes certain types of protests, right? Let's say the way you protest is to disrupt at the beginning, get me off my game. Right, knock me off my political orchestration. Um, what, the, 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 choreography. The, cho yeah, sorry, yeah, that's where choreography, right? Knock me off. Now, you can't knock me off the game. I'm ready for this, right? <laughs> I, try it. Um, I'm ready for it. But if you try to knock someone off the game, it alters the message. And that might be part of the protest, right? So I think inherently, if you say the rule is you don't speak till the end of Q&A, you are necessarily accepting that the person is going to come here, give his choreographed shtick, and that's exactly what he's going to give. Um, I'm okay with that, right? I, I think the alternative of allowing disruption is knocking off my game. Well, I never talked about what I want to talk about there. I had an entire 45 minute lecture plan. I didn't say a word of it. So I said, let me react to what's going on. And what I did, I think, was valuable. But if it's the case that they can always knock a speaker off, then that prevents the students from inviting me from hearing what they want me to invite to talk about. Right. Can I answer this question? Yeah, no, I think it's, it's, very, it's very interesting. Like you, I, I'm very concerned about sanitizing protest method. You know, when, when a visiting head of state visits, say the president of China, mm -hmm. they will allow protests, but the protest may be halfway across town, mm -hmm. so that uh, President Xi n never has to hear or listen to them. Um, I prefer the interruption method, and I prefer that, that uh, sometimes we liven things up, maybe with lots of interruptions. But there is going to have to be a balance, because maybe there's a distinction between occasional interruptions, mm -hmm. Lots of interruptions, but each one individually motivated, and a deliberately orchestrated wall of sound. Mm -hmm. uh, of, and and maybe, maybe, the organizers should be particularly concerned about the last of those three. But it doesn't follow that a concern about that gives you a, the appropriate lens through which to view the the interruption. I do think also that the university's interest in this matter is primarily in protecting its lectures and its seminars and the academic freedom. I'm not sure why the university should be regarded as having the appropriate standing to discipline students who are attending a meeting like this. Uh -huh. I mean, no doubt you're all in fear of what Trevor might do to you. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but yeah. now, which, what do you think of them standing right behind me as, as more protest? Uh, what, what's your opinion on that form? Yeah, so you were worried particularly about the, not worried, but you, you, it crossed your mind about the thought of violence and so on. And so, I mean, people sometimes stand, you saw that in the hearings for, Judge Kavanaugh, uh, they stand up from the seats that they've been assigned, but seats are assigned and they weren't entitled to go and stand behind the, mm -hmm. behind the senators. Um, so sometimes there may be rules where people can stand. Probably here nobody had thought, it didn't occur to anybody to have a rule about where you can stand. Nope. And here you guys are, you're surrounding us. <laughs> there's, no, there's no escape. The exits are blocked. The, exit, <laughs> the, the exits are blocked and the fire marshal is irate. Um, I think the more this happens, obviously, the more you have to be concerned. And eventually the fire marshal will have to have some work. But the notion that universities, as part of their mission, have to sanitize our protests and discipline and cower us into silence so that we can be herded in to listen to to messages from far less worthy speakers than Josh Blackman. Thank you. So that much. worries me. Uh, I think we have time for one last one. We, we can, oh, do we have to leave the room? Is that the problem? Um, Isaiah, do we have to leave the room? We, we might have. Somebody will tell us. <laughs> Somebody will tell us. Someone will kick us out. Keep, keep going to the throw us out. They'll, they'll, they'll heckle and interrupt our speech. We can make a point out of it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that'd be wonderful. Uh, you, sir. Uh, I'm Canadian, and I went to school in England at KC at Oxford. And this happens in both places. So I wonder the extent to which the Anglosphere hates each other, not going to resolve the issues that you worry about. I should also say this piece of household chat by the Member of Parliament, when they, when they uh, say inflammatory things about another member, they will, they will censor her conduct. Uh, two questions which are kind of boring. One is boring, which is how much of the extent of this framing of defamation is a function of the history of the common law? They use an established category, and maybe there was a better category to which approach such matters. That's a boring question. The second one is two weeks ago, the European Court of Human Rights basically told the woman from Austria, um, to putting it in the context of criticizing religion versus trying to criticize the community, the woman said that. Muhammad married Aisha when she was six years old. He consummated marriage from the Hadith when she was nine, and therefore, under our modern category, she was a pedophile, and she wants to promulgate this idea. Uh, she, this is outside the rubric of protected speech under the European Court of Human Rights. I wonder if you could speak to that sort of division in the rest of Alden Well, I mean, look, um, I, I don't know the case you're mentioning, so I can't speak too much in detail about it, but 
you're having someone who's being prosecuted for expressing a political opinion that no doubt would offend a sizable population based on their religion, um, I, I would not support such a prosecution. I think the response to people saying things like that is to shame them and humiliate them. I mean, you, you often have, uh, today more than ever else, is a social media mob that when someone says something stupid and offensive, they're mobbed by social forces and they're shunned, they might lose their job, they might lose their political support. And it's, I think it's fairly effective. And I would much rather have a social shaming than having the state impose force. I mean, look, if you have a speaker who goes to a campus and just spills crap all over the table and says terrible things, don't invite him back, right? And, and just one point, a lot of these no, uh, neo-Nazis like Richard Spencer, they're not actually invited. They rent space on campus. At state universities, anyone can come and rent a room. That's how they get to campus. They're not being invited by a student group. I would much favor, favor social sanction than state-imposed punishment. I think that's the answer. For something like that, shun her. Shun her if you don't like what they say. Yeah, just very briefly, I, I am familiar with the case, the Austrian case that you mentioned. It wouldn't, the prosecution probably wouldn't be permitted under the hate speech laws of some countries and would be permitted under the hate speech laws of other countries. So Israel, for example, has a, um, a law that prohibits publishing a publication that is liable crudely to offend the religious faith or sentiments of others. An example, mm -hmm. whereas the, the 29J section I gave you from the British Public Order Act tries to distinguish between hate speech and mm -hmm. crude offense. Now, there are tough, tough cases in between. And the famous Danish cartoons, do you remember those? Yeah, from yeah, yeah. 10 years yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, they had cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad with a bomb in his turban. And they said, well, this wasn't attacking Muslims, this was just attacking the Prophet. To which you would have to ask, well, why would this seem like a sensible way of attacking the Prophet? And moreover, you would read it in the context of the script surrounding the cartoons, which was much more anti-Muslim than it was anti-Muhammad. So sometimes it, it, it's a matter of judgment, and where there's judgment, there's always liable to be different opinions, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean to say that we should always flinch from such judgment, and particularly in communities where tempers are already running high because of issues about terrorism, uh, you may well think that, that uh, a judgment is necessary and enforced it. Uh, you miss. Uh, thank you both so much. Um, I'm curious about your dismissal, Professor, as certain speech is just speech. Um, we don't, speech can be more than just uttering of words. Speech is what can make people, two people married or war declared. Um, and I, I grew up in France where it's illegal to deny the Holocaust and hate speech laws um, specify that you're not allowed to say anything that would incite violence towards a specific group. And so I, my, the way that I feel about saying um, utterances about a certain sort of community to encourage hatred or discrimination or violence toward that people is salient, saliently different from these defamation um, sort of categories of hate speech. And so I'm curious as to how, how, how do you just dismiss that as just speech when it clearly has social, cultural, and physical consequences? Thank you for that. Um, so th the question is, how do you distinguish different types of speech if they lead to action, right? Um, true threats under our law are not protected, under First Amendment law. <coughs> if you burn a cross with the intent to intimidate someone, you can prosecute under American law. That's Virginia versus Blacks. That's one case. Um, if I incite imminent violence, right? If I stir the truth and say, let's go tear down Columbia, those, those, those bastards uptown, let's take them down, right? And I incite you all to violence, right? Uh, I could probably be prosecuted under imminent incitement. It's got to be inside. You know, we should probably storm Columbia next week. Let's plan it and we'll get some tea beforehand, right? Not imminent. There's often a tough call between where speech and conduct lies. Very often speech is conduct. If I burn an American flag, if I burn a Koran, right, that's a speech act that's conduct that will very likely perhaps incite and cause a disruption, right? So we do have the ability for speech as conduct to actually give rise to liability, but What's the proximity of your speech to the bad stuff, right? If I gave a lecture on YouTube talking about, and I'll use an example, if someone gave a lecture on YouTube talking about the Prophet Muhammad, right? And they're not talking to anyone in particular. And maybe someone watches that and gets very incited, right? I think there's too much of an attenuation between the speech and the action, right? If I say, that person has this characteristic that's false, that's a direct defamation action they can sue for. So I think you have to look at the proximity of the statement at hand to the harm, and as that as that proximity grows, I think it stays less of an interest. And let's mention the Sullivan case, which you mentioned, right? When you defame a public official in the United States, you have to show that you did so with malice, that you deliberately 
made a misstatement of fact. Why would the case itself be decided that way? In the early years of the Republic, we had people with the Sedition Act, the, 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 this law which was passed by the Federalist Congress to punish the Republicans. And uh, a lot of people thought that law was unconstitutional. It was used to basically punish those who were outside the political mainstream, that those are the Republicans. Um, my concern is we can very quickly shift from those who uh, hold outside political mainstream views to those who hold outside religious main views, because often law and politics interact, law and religion interact, uh, immigration's a hot political topic, and I'm afraid of blurring the two. So I don't know if I answered your question, but those are my general thoughts. Thank you, though. Can I just give a little Please. response to this? Because I think what you say is absolutely right. And I don't think it's a question of the relationship of speech to conduct. Speech is conduct for reasons, and especially when it's um, not just words shouted out in the moment of inebriation, but when it's um, pamphlets or posters or postings going up on the internet that has a certain durability. It becomes part of the built environment. And I, my first encounter with this, um, can I bore you with it, was uh, a million years ago when I first went to Oxford as a graduate student. I used to hang around the courtrooms of the, the lawyer and, uh, to see how they did things over there. And a man had been arrested and charged with hate speech because he'd gone around a village outside Oxford and put up signs on every lamppost comparing uh, Britain, British people of African descent with apes and gibbons and baboons and so on. And he pasted them up and left them there. It wasn't inciting anything. It was just creating a massively toxic uh, environment. And there was this crusty old judge half asleep, you know, he's obviously formed in the early days of the common, of the common law. <laughs> and you wouldn't have expected him to have any, any patience with this newfangled legislation. And when it came his turn after the jury came back after 10 minutes and found the guy guilty, um, the, the judge said, what were you thinking? How do you think we're supposed to run a peaceful, decent society here accommodating people from very different groups if idiots like you are going, going around pasting, pasting, up all this, uh, pasting up all this stuff? He said, haven't, you, haven't we learned anything about the dangers of creating this sort of toxic environment? I think that's important because it's still speech, but it's speech that now lingers in a visible form and changes the way the society looks and therefore changes the environment in which people have to live their lives and walk with their children and conduct their business. What did he tell the judge? He, he wisely remained silent. He <laughs> accepted the short prison sentence. <laughs> Wise. Uh, you, sir, at the back. I have one point to Josh, one point to Jeremy. Uh, I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know, John. Uh, but uh, Frank Collin, the organizer of the Stokely March, uh, said in the campaign anticipation of the march that we're out to get the Jews and we're going to use the First Amendment as a cover to do it. And one of his lieutenants says, we want to terrify them. We want them to think that they're coming at us again. Uh, and because we believe that the problem is not that six million died but that too many survive. Uh, that seems to me not to fall under the category that you described when you discussed it. And then for Jeremy, I think for me, uh, you slid back and forth, I thought, uh, between the choreography appropriate to politics and the choreography appropriate to the academy. And I would make a very strong distinction. Well, the, Paris, the, the choreography appropriate to politics does indeed include uh, disruption and all other kinds of things, which to my mind as a former dean would be entirely inappropriate uh, in a university setting. Choreogra choreography of university means exactly what you uh, said it doesn't mean, which is that people come, they do what they've been assigned to do, uh, they're allowed to do it, and then there's a question and answer period uh, where they are challenged in exactly the same kind of terms uh, that presided over their remarks in the first place. We call that the give and take of reasons. And the give and take of reasons, to my mind, has no room for heckling whatsoever. And were I still a dean, and most people are very pleased that I am not, uh, were I still a dean and there were hecklers in any such meeting, I would throw them out, discipline, and probably expel them. Uh, yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, a very great free speech writer on these matters. Stanley, there's a difference between the choreography of universities and their teaching modes and their research modes on the one hand and the choreography of meetings like this. For all I know that there's a group of students uh, in a religious organization 
associated with the law school conducting a mass as we speak. And the choreography of that has nothing to do with what happens in the classroom. So one question is, should we think of informal groups by student clubs as being conducted in the shadow of political choreography, which you've acknowledged is different, or being conducted in the shadow of the choreography of the classroom? And I think that's an open question, but an important one. Okay. Just to add to your, the only reason I wanted to, to, to go to butt in front of uh, Josh was to add to what Frank Collins said in the Scotty incident, because he didn't just do the Hitler should have finished the job um, uh, uh, vile uh, rhetoric, but he also said that uh, we want to reach the good people. We want to get the fierce anti-Semites who have to live among the Jews. We want to get them to come out of the woodwork and stand up for themselves. He's wanting to elicit a certain, a certain response in the targets and elicit a certain response in the fellow travelers of the commission. You got the answer now. Thank you. Um, well, Stanley, thank you. I've heard your work for years. So grateful for the question. Uh, I'll ask you a question. I'll do mine. What would you have done to the kids in this room? Would you have expelled them? If you, if you were the dean of CUNY, what, what would you have done to these kids? For doing what? For interrupting for an eight minutes, staying behind me and shouting me down. Oh, yes, I would have done that. Nothing did nothing. Now, let me answer yeah. your question. Despite the, the fact it wasn't a class. <laughs> Despite the fact it wasn't a class. Right, because I agree with Rob Post when he says that anything Robert Post is a former dean of the Yale Law School. Now, in a series of recent essays, he's making the point that anything that occurs uh, on the spaces, in the spaces presided over by the university should be regarded as a part of the university and therefore answerable, says Post, uh, to the university's mission. So for him, the question always is, does this activity, whatever it is, uh, contribute to the educational mission of the university? And if it doesn't, administrators have every right to discipline and regulate it. And I totally agree with that. Okay, now, now let me answer your question, right? Um, to use the, the Knox example from Skokie, it, it, it's odious, it's hateful on religious points, also that wants to see the past and see certain groups expelled. And push that, I guess. Point, don't come after me. Um, You've seen yeah. a man for all seasons too often. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, you, sir. Uh, if you need to go, you can just go, but uh, we'll, 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 I'll stay as long as he'll stay. We'll answer questions. It's awkward to talk to him. Uh, thank you guys for coming. You're groundling, that's what you are. <laughs> I was a little late, so I apologize um, if you guys touched on this. But to the Skokie argument, my temple is on Dempster where the Nazis were going to march. Famine the Holocaust and well on. Um, I agree with Blackman on this point because at least what Newborn said to me, and he was one of the lawyers for the ACLU on that case, is that his gamble was that actually what Collins wanted was to be shut down, was to be martyrs and read the profile of their issue. And I think he was proven right when they won the case and they ended up not marching. So my question to you, Professor Wolf, um, two of them actually. One is, and if you touched on this already, I apologize. Go ahead, not to answer, go ahead. But, you can answer the positive argument that the best way to defeat hate speech is to have it out in the open with better speech in a liberal society like ours. Mm -hmm. I think the example being Charlottesville, actually, which is the next year after Charlottesville, the protest was weakened. It went to DC and there was 12 people there because right. I think the country saw, and any potential converts maybe even saw how ridiculous and disgusting the speech that they gave was. Right. Um, my second question being, what do you say to the argument that when weak groups make arguments for stronger speech laws, they make a rod for their own beating later on. That laws will always be used by the powerful to, when they can be, to hurt the weak. And for instance, the hate speech codes in the University of Michigan in the 50s, when all this was going on, um, during hate was going on, it was almost exclusively used against minorities until it was shut down. And so that's my question. Yeah. On the second question, I mean, this is going to be very brief, and then we should stop and, and, and get going. But on the second question, I think it's, it's an endemic difficulty. For rule of law reasons, these regulations have to be drafted in general terms, and they can't necessarily be um, used only for the benefit of some groups and not others. And so uh, Nadine Stroll and I have regular engagements of this sort. Uh, talks about the fact that the, the, um, the, uh, um, uh, the regulation in the Bohane case had been used against Jehovah's Witnesses, mm -hmm. uh, for example. But the Jehovah's Witnesses had been using it to question the sort of dignity of character. And you've got sort of nested minorities versus minorities versus minorities. The aim of the law is some degree of stability. 
may be a problem, it may not be a problem. In principle, members of any other group, minority or majority. Now, on the first point, uh, that dealing with hate speech, probably the best way is to have it out in the open with some sort of response, which is more speech as, a, as an option. Um, speech laws also have very powerful anti-Nazi movements, very powerful counter demonstrations, uh, very powerful anti-racist education programs, very powerful counter speech for hate speeches and counters. So, uh, plus they have the hate speech laws as well. They think of this as one more element in the armory. And so everybody who believes in hate speech also believes in answering hate speech uh, if they possibly can. That's partly what you see going on sometimes in these campus protests. They're attempting to answer, uh, answer the speech with more speech immediately, not more speech in a week's time when nobody's listening, or more speech uh, half a mile down the road when nobody else speaks. Speech is the response. But I also respect to revert to certain sources of speech. There's not these You can't compare what's happening and things hate being rekindled. But for them, the question was always, do they have more than they would have had had they not had these, these measures? Holocaust denial, and um, the great, first great action against Holocaust denial was by, um, uh, I think, um, General Eisenhower who uh, rounded up the people of a town outside a concentration camp, whether it was Bergen-Belsen or Dachau, or mm -hmm. one of, and required these cities, without the option, to walk and see what would be in They all walked through it. They understood it. It was going to be so searing and so uh, important for society. Social interest, public interest. Of those, of those memories. And I wasn't doing that as it were, as, a, as an application of law, but the sentiment was the same. These horrors shall not be forgotten, not by the people in whose backyard they happened. And uh, they are going to be forced to confront them. Uh, and not walk away. Anyway, Joshua, well thank you. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank Appreciate you. That was, your time. That was wonderful. Yeah. I'll send you the link. I'll put this online. That'd be great. Okay.